Apache Kafka 2.8. In its wild habitat, as a bare metal deployment. These deployments are rare in these times of managed services. A good thing too. There it is, you see the, the power lights, the blinking status lights, the SD cards. Yes, a bare metal Kafka 2.8. Well, it turns out I'm not David Attenborough. I'm Tim Berglund with Confluent, and I'd like to tell you all about Apache Kafka 2.8. As usual, I want to go through all the kips that made it into 2.8. Those are the major chunks of new functionality, the Kafka improvement proposals that are in 2.8, and we're going to divide them into three categories. That's going to be Core Kafka, Kafka Connect, and Kafka Streams. So let's dive in. Kip 676, respect the logging hierarchy. Now, uh, if you know Log4j, in Java, loggers are hierarchical. Logger names are usually modeled after package names like org, Apache, Kafka, clients, producer, org, Apache, Kafka, clients, consumer, something like that. And there were three ways to change logging levels in Kafka. Two of those ways didn't respect the log4j logging hierarchies. Namely, if you used the describe configs RPC call or the log4j controller mbean, good old mbean, um, you didn't get hierarchical uh, rippling up of, of the log changes, but you did get that if you changed it with the REST API. Well, now thanks to 676, you get it with all three. KIP 673, emit JSONs with new auto-generated schema. Now, um, with there's a request tracing that you could turn on. Um, if you set request channel to debug, then you'd get a JSON-like output from uh, that request trace. And by JSON-like, I mean there were curly braces and we were supposed to respect that, but it wasn't parsable as JSON. Well, now with this, it actually is, so you can extract that and parse it with any tool that parses JSON, so huge win for interpreting logs in a smart way. KIP 679, producer will enable the strongest delivery guarantee by default. So it's been a little while now since we've had EOS, exactly one semantics. I think that was KIP, I want to say 98. Uh, it was in the 90s, and it was some years ago, about four years ago at the time of this recording, almost. So uh, it's been with us, but it's not enabled by default. And you have two things, two switches. That's uh, enable item potence set to true uh, for the item potent producer, and axe set to all. And by default, prior to 679, enable item potence was off, and axe was defaulting to one. And so you didn't have the strongest producer guarantees. Well, now, enable item potence is on by default. Axe is set to all by default. Of course, you can do whatever you want with these settings, but the defaults are just a little more robust for the producer now. KIP 684 is support mutual TLS authentication on SASL SSL listeners. The way this used to work, this is a little tricky. Um, if you had, if you're, if you're using TLS client authentication with SASL SSL listeners, if you have SSL client auth configured, and if you had like multiple listeners uh, connected to a broker with, I'm uh, sorry, SSL client auth set to required, then all of the listeners would have to support TLS client authentication. And the anti-pattern that grew up around this was that you basically have to distinguish client identity by deploying different certificates to each client and setting the distinguished name to a different field, which means more certificate management, which means literally zero people are happy. Jeremy Bentham, call your office. Utility is not being maximized here. And actually, Jeremy Bentham, you can't call your office. You don't need to. So now, as you see in the middle of the slide, you can set listener name and then a named listener, SSL client auth, and enable it that way, and use uh, SASL to identify clients. So you, the connection is encrypted with TLS, and clients are identifying themselves with SASL, best of both worlds, actually using all the technologies that we've got on the table. So KIP 684 ought to make your certificate management a little easier. KIP 700 adds a describe cluster API. This is nice. This used to be buried in the metadata API, but now has uh, an API of its own. And uh, this now gives you basic cluster metadata is likely to expand in the future with what it offers. But it's always nice to get a new 
CRISPR admin APIs. This is another one of those things that you might say smells like rain. It feels like this is Kafka getting a little more cloud friendly because that seems like a thing if you're going to be running multiple clusters in the cloud. You might want to know uh, stuff about a cluster and know it well. Uh, lots of uses for this quite apart from cloud deployments, but one of those things that I just kind of like to see happening. And of course, the first release of KIPP 500. Now, I need to caution you before you break out the champagne or whatever it is you celebrate with, this is not production ready yet. Kafka's new built-in consensus protocol, for example, is not doing ACLs yet. If you want to do ACLs, you still have to have Zookeeper around, but you need to start uh, working with this in your test environments, your development environments. Uh, and you see on the slide there are some impressive performance improvements for uh, controlled shutdown with two million partitions. Two million, that's twice as good as Dr. Evil ever wanted. Uh, we are going from, it looks like two minutes, 15 seconds uh, in our measurements with Zookeeper, 32 seconds with the Quorum controller and uncontrolled shutdown, failure of a broker. We're going from eight and a half minutes to 37 seconds. So it's here. It is so exciting to see KIPP 500 merged into a formal release. Again, development only. Watch this space for more, but it's here. This is a big deal. Kafka Connect. We have one KIPP, that's 661, exposing task configurations in the Connect REST API. So here's the deal. When you submit config to a connector, right? You're submitting you the post or a put, uh, that JSON document, the configuration information. Some connectors uh, well, you know, all connectors are going to pass that on to tasks. Some connectors might do some kind of computation on that, and so the config values that get passed down to the tasks might not be what you had in the JSON document. And that's fine, but you might want to look at what those config values is. I mean, it's connect. Sometimes you want to look at these things. So now with this KIP, you've got an API where you can explicitly get the configuration information that the task actually believes it has, rather than what you last told the connector. So nice improvement in management and visibility for all your connect troubleshooting needs. Kafka streams. We've got a few KIPs to look at here. KIP 671, introducing the uncaught exception handler. Now, exception management in a streams topology can be a little tricky. Remember, this code is not really running in a place where you can just go try and catch things. Uh, you're building your topology and you're passing it off and executing it in the Kafka streams client. Uh, and it, it does its thing. So what do you do about exceptions? Well, if there's an uncaught exception, I can now register a handler. And that's through this handy new interface called Streams Uncaught Exception Handler. And it's got a method called handle to which the throwable in question is passed when there's an uncaught exception. Inside that handler, you can decide what to do with that exception. And you can tell Streams to do one of three things. What it would have done is kill the task. Uh, that's that's running uh, that that chunk of your streams topology those those partitions what it can do now is one of three things it can shut down the client that's the default it can replace the thread so let that thread die because there was an exception and create a new thread uh, to take up that work or it can as Lord Denethor might say go and die in what way seems best to you that's shut down application and maybe that's a little severe but hey you might want to do that so in any case just a little bit cleaner way and more flexible way of handling uncaught exceptions and speaking of threads dying in a streams application now we have KIPP 663 an API to start and stop threads so when a streams application starts up it has a configurable number of threads running they can die and they don't come back uh, if, and you know, you might want to increase them um, to, to bring those dead threads back. You might have an increased workload and you might want to take advantage of cores that, that you're not or whatever. You might want more threads for any reason. So uh, here now is an API where I can at runtime add threads or remove threads without having to bounce the application. So pretty handy for manageability of a streams app. And as usual, there are more KIPs. I'm just giving you the highlights here out in the woods and uh, you want to check out the blog post read the release notes that's always got all the details and as always i want to know what you're building so download this release get started with it please check out the kip 500 functionality in development that's super exciting stuff let us know how it goes